morning. My name is uh, George Mbedi. And I'm Professor and uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to be part of this uh, virtual conference and to, to, to uh, moderate uh, this facility. So with that, I greet you all, including distinguished guests and all the participants on this call. Without any waste of time, we've got um, um, you know, distinguished speakers as part of this panel, uh, four distinguished uh, speakers. And uh, I must warn already in advance that I'm going to be strict in terms of, of time, colleague, colleagues. I see that um, uh, Prof. Peter Hammond has uh, already won us extra five minutes. So this will enable us to engage a little bit with the, um, the presentations and the thoughts uh, shared by you colleagues on top of already the provocative share, uh, thoughts already shared by um, uh, Prof. Mao and also by uh, uh, our moderator and then also by uh, Professor Herman. Without any waste of time, uh, colleagues, if you could allow me. And, you know, before I get to what I wanted to say now, I just want to nudge our, our, our speakers now, if they could also spare us um, a minute or two for a little bit of engagement before we go into the bigger moderation, that will be great. Um, and, and follow the standard set by uh, Prof. Prof. Herman. Otherwise, in the main, you have 10 minutes and no minute or second more. So without any waste of time, I would like to hand over to our first speaker this morning. And uh, our first speaker is um, uh, colleague of Elam Ohatmel. I hope I pronounce your surname correctly, a uh, colleague. And um, he's lecturer at the School of Applied Social Studies at the University College Cork in Ireland. And he will be addressing us on a very relevant topic, which is the globalization of power, leaving the common good behind. So over to you, Phelan. Um, thank you very much, George. Uh, I suppose what I wanted to do was to start off with a quote. And this is a quote from Mao Tross, uh, Tolstoy in 1982. And it says, I sit on a man's back, choking him, making him carry me, and yet assure myself and others that I am very sorry for him and wish to rise his lap by all possible means except by getting off his back. And I think really that's the thing that I wanted to, to raise here at this particular conference. The notion that whenever we talk about human rights, the notion of human rights is dependent to a large extent on access to power and certainly access to the, the economic resources necessary to realize those human rights. People can tell me and say that you've got human rights by virtue of the fact that you're a human being, but unless you've got access to power to realize those rights or the economic um, uh, resources to enable you to, to access the rights, then often rights will be denied to people. And we know this because we live in a world where the discourse on human rights, rights bestowed on all of us by, by equally by virtue of the fact that we're humans, is now predominant. Everybody talks about human rights as, and, and says they're in favour of human rights. But it's also a world which is ill divided in the realisation of rights, a world where a lack of basic socioeconomic rights condemns millions to hunger, millions to force, to ill health, to limited access to shelter, to accommodation, to limited access to healthcare and education. Um, and this is in a world of plenty, where we were able to provide for everybody if we really, really wanted to. And it's clear, from my point of view, that the realisation of human rights is directly related to access to power and resources. And it's intrinsically linked to relationships between human beings. All subject to the outcome of human agency, because we have all of us have a human agency and um, constant struggles on a daily basis by communities around the world to try to achieve human rights and, and realize human rights. Um, and I think that this is one of the things that is often forgotten about whenever we talk about human rights. Whenever uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was developed in 1948, uh, the backdrop to that was the Second World War. There was a notion in the world, particularly in the Western world, in the rich world, that we didn't want another war like that. 
certainly we didn't want to see uh, a repetition of the Holocaust, where millions of people were exterminated in concentration camps, just on the basis of who they were, on the basis of their ethnic origin, on the basis of um, their difference from uh, a particular ideological view of what what was supposed to be a human being. There was a notion um, after the Second World War that something had to be done to ensure that those types of activities didn't take place again, that minorities in society weren't, ex weren't discriminated against and weren't exterminated. And you have this notion of developing, particularly with um, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, from America, the, 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 the wife of the president, the ideas about civil and political rights. And of course, one of the difficulties with that is that in order to um, realize a political right and a civil right, you, have, you, you often have to have the means. You have to have the, the economic means, for example, to be able to read books to find out about political opinions and, and political ideologies. You need to be educated. You need to have access to education. You need to be free from illness. You need to be able to, 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 to be healthy uh, in order to be able to concentrate on, on the civil issues and, 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 and participate in civil society. If you don't have them, then that limits your ability to, to participate fully in a, in, in a society. What's the result? That whenever attempts were made to articulate these rights in, in, in the UN uh, conventions, originally there was an idea that the UN Bill of Rights, um, there were differences of, uh, of opinion as in, in relation to this. Um, the idea that rights um, could simply just emerge from, from a world in which there were different, exist, uh, different experiences of existence, people living in different contexts with different cultures, different social, economic, political, uh, uh, and cultural contexts, uh, and, uh, and uh, different contexts in, even within the same country. Um, meant that it was very, very difficult to, to, to formulate particular rights, even to the point whenever uh, a decision was made by the 1960s to develop separate conventions and separate covenants to allow different countries to sign up to them. Uh, so you have a whole range of you have about seven different conventions now, Council of the Rights of the Child, Council of the Rights of People with Disabilities, etc. Even after that, once a state has signed up to those conventions, it is not always the case that people can realize the rights that are contained within those conventions because they're trying to survive, they're trying to live, uh, they're trying to uh, 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 ensure that, um, that, that, that their lives are sustainable, etc. And the recent pandemic has shown us the, the difficulties in a well-divided world of providing for all uh, the, 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 the peoples of the world. The, uh, the concentration of uh, vaccines in the hands of the few in, in the Western world, for example, is, um, uh, shows how difficult it is to create a notion of uh, human rights whenever people are thinking of themselves in their own particular countries. Um, so in my own particular view, I think that what we need to be cons considering is, is it possible to have human rights, to civil and political rights without economic and social rights? Is it possible to have uh, human rights without having cultural rights? So since it is what we need to be talking about whenever we talk about human rights is, um, uh, what are the most important fundamental rights that people need. And it seems to me that the most important fundamental rights that people need are access to power and access to economic resources for the basic necessities of life. It, it looks like we have uh, uh, lost Phelan, or is it just me, colleagues? Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yes. All right. Okay. Yes. No, I think my ten minutes is up, so that was why I stopped. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, also for reading us um, a few minutes, uh, uh, Phelan. Before I move over to the next presentation, um, you you really touch on key issues, you know, and really difficult questions. And thanks for doing that. For example, in you know the the concept of human rights as 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 we know it is influenced by the local circumstances 
where the, the, the people who should enjoy or exercise these rights find themselves in. And in some parts of the world, some people may be worried about the here and now needs, you know, as you have rightly pointed out, that um, what, what are the fundamental rights to a particular community? And one could also bring in this uh, divide between the global north and the global south. And in, 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 in your own view, and briefly, Philem, what is the best way to bridge this, um, 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 you know, uh, global, uh, this, this divide between the global north and the global south in terms of what, what is it that should be fundamental? If you take a lot of people in the global south, many are worried about the here and now, putting food in their stomach and so on, something that other people, mainly in the global north, may take for granted. How do we bridge that is my question. My opinion is that it is, this, is, this is to do with ideology and it's to do with politics. It depends on what your ideological perspective is. You can't, you can't separate ideology from human rights. Human rights is informed by ideological perspectives. It's, a, it's informed by our view of human beings. What, is the, what are human beings and are human beings entitled to equality? And unfortunately, in, in the global north and probably globally generally, we have a view of, uh, of human rights being in competition, of human, uh, 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 the notion of uh, um, the, the survival of the fittest, the notion that um, uh, you can, uh, the, the, that it's the pursuit of profit is, is, is what is uh, the, the, the natural um, impetus, I suppose, within human beings. And one of the difficulties with that is that it, 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 it creates a, a dysfunctional, uh, in my view, dysfunctional relationship between human beings. Because human beings should be, it seems to me, be about social interaction, about helping one another, about uh, uh, caring for one another, about sharing the world that we live in. And the difficulty is that if you have an ideology which is about me, myself, I, which is about um, promoting um, the, the, the pursuit of profit above all anything else rather than the, the pursuit of human welfare, then you're going to have inequalities in society and you're also going to have dysfunctional relationships between human beings and you're going to have the concentration of power and resources within the hands of the few, which is what we have in this particular uh, world order. So it seems to me that you need to challenge the world order and the world order being challenged requires an ideological um, uh, change, I suppose. Uh, and all of us have got human agency, all of us got the ability to do something about things that we think are wrong. Uh, even if we're weak, even we're powerless, by joining together into the power of one, we have strength, we have power, we increase our power, and it seems to me that that's what's, what's necessary. If you can just say something, see whenever the UN was established, it was established, uh, the Charter was established uh, and, and ratified by 50 members, 50 member states, uh, and then um, Poland joined 51. Now we've got 183 nation states who are, who are UN members. And when we pose the question, where did those, those nation states all come from? And they came predominantly, they, they came, they were colonized countries who gained their independence. Yes. Um, so all the countries that actually in the had to fight for their independence against the 50 odd or just less than 50 colonizing powers that set up the UN in the first place. So the UN was talking about uh, uh, human rights, but at the same time, many of those countries that were prepared to sign up to the UN Declaration of Human Rights had colonies. And they were oppressing the people in those colonies terribly. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's an hypocrisy around human rights. That needs to be answered at last. Yeah, well, um, I think this is where we'll have to leave it with those uh, provocative uh, remarks. Uh, you know, I liked what you said about that we need to address this issue of survival of the fittest. It reminds me of an African saying that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with others. And I think this is what we need to challenge, you know, this uh, um, idea that, you know, um, you, you'll do well if it's just me, myself, and I, so that as a world, then we move together. 
I wish we had more time, but this is where we'll have to leave it, colleague, and I'm sure we'll pick up on this later in the uh, general discussion. Thank you very much. Colleagues, let's give uh, Philem a, a warm round of a virtual applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Colleagues, we'll now move over to um, 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 uh, our colleague, Maria Francesca St Stajano. I hope I pronounce your um, uh, surname correctly. Uh, Maria is the director of the Center for China Studies uh, uh, in, at the International Relations Institute uh, at the National University of La Plata. She will be addressing us on human rights in Latin America then and now. Colleague, you've got 10 minutes, but it will help us if you could win us two minutes or so. Over to you. Okay, thank you so much, George. You had a perfect pronunciation of my name, so no problem. And thank you to Peter, of course, and to Professor Mao as well to be here today. Um, so very difficult issues, no? Uh, so uh, we think what is human, no? Uh, several, uh, several scholars have uh, ask this, no? So if we think that in 1993, uh, the, uh, the declaration uh, uh, of the Conference of Human Rights of Vienna has to clarify, for example, that women's rights are human rights. So we are very far to understand what is human, no? I mean, uh, it's never uh, enough to clarify what is human. <laughs> so um, a, very, a very difficult question, especially made by Professor Mao and Professor Herman, but maybe during the... Uh, the debate we uh, we point out on this no uh, now i will uh, talk about latin american characteristics i say no uh, because if, um, if we think about a common uh, vocation a common uh, human nature uh, of course but we have also to think about peculiarities no uh, in a special social and historical context so um when, for example, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was written and signed in uh, 1948, in Latin America, we were in presence of strong legacies uh, of decolonization. Uh, this caused a strong delay in the development of the region with a related lack of political and economic autonomy. The structural violence suffered during colonization and used in decolonization remain as a constitutive matrix of, of uh, relation on a social and political level. Uh, furthermore, the strong religious influence, regional competition, and the difficult achievement of authentic autonomy have built a might, a mystification of Europe as the model of uh, civilization and development. Which has functioned uh, as sorry, a... sorry, 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 Maria. May, may I ask all the participants to please mute? Um, this participant may. May you please mute? I don't know if our host could mute the participant. Okay. May. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, carry on. Yeah. No problem. So. Um, we have in Latin America a sort of mystification no? of Europe as the only model of civilization and development, which has functioned as stepmother, executioner, uh, or the former colonies autonomy. Uh, almost everywhere, a profound change in traditional social structure have been stimulated, promoting the formation of culturally evolved elites who now, however, not always become the driving force behind the claims for political autonomy. These elites formed in the colonial states took Western political ideals and method as their own, but at the same time they have uh, claimed their traditions, becoming interpreters uh, in and against the colonial power government of the aspiration for independence of their peoples and promoting the creation of movements 
which variously contribute to gradually uh, spreading the ideals of independence among the masses. So there is a double soul we can see in uh, Latin America, one vocated to Western, that is the majority, and one who understood that Latin America is not Europe or USA, but needs its uh, own path. So uh, thinking about this, the Latin American characteristics in terms of human rights are, for example, the right to the hurt, uh, the so-called Pachamama, the indigenous people liked women's rights deeply repressed due to the traditional machismo and strong religious repression. Think about the decriminalization of abortion that has achieved in Argentina only in 2020. And in Colombia, a few days ago, February, in this February 2022, or to the serial violence and killings of women. In fact, there is, um, there is, we are talking about feminicide and uh, the movement Ni Una Menos, uh, no uh, one um, less, uh, uh, was born in, in Latin America. Uh, children's rights is seriously violated, violated if we think that, uh, for example, the worst in terms of extreme poverty of the population, the consequences of which are massively transferred to children who suffer from malnutrition and lack of access to basic education. All these problems are systemic in Latin America, difficult to solve due to the progressive privatization of social rights, especially health and education. For example, only in Argentina, the university is totally free and maintains a level of excellence, even if public schools function as canteens for poor children. This has uh, generated an even wider social gap in the creation of two irreconcilable parallel paths. Many reasons of this situation depend on the inability to emancipate to at an, an economic financial level. Many Latin American countries, especially Argentina, constantly suffer from monetary reper repercussions, especially systematic inflation that has um, uh, sorry, the test um, increased. And for example, uh, impoverishing the population throughout a gradual reduction uh, in purchasing power. The population in condition of extreme, extreme poverty has increased significantly in recent years, reaching 40% of populations. In Argentina, for example, the current government prohibited the movement of capital abroad and during previous government, additional taxes had been imposed on those who traveled outside Argentina or those who made transfers abroad or brought foreign currencies. Another barrier that grips in Latin American population is the infrastructural one, both logistic and virtual. Uh, backwardness that has led to a delay in digital development and therefore a lack of inclusion. This was even more evident during these pandemic years in which virtual communication is the only possibility. The traditional cooperation imposed by European countries, for example, has not helped too much being characterized by being a verticalist evangelization without taking into consideration the human development of the population. The very concerning situation is the traditional way to interpret human rights. Formally, we have permanent references to people-centered approach, but a project of humanity, a new human is capable of achieving human progress throughout an equitable distribution of resources is not being implemented. Unfortunately, the economic system inspired by the mere realization of profit now exercise absolute dominion over politics, which therefore is powerless in face of constant violation in terms of human rights. This is due, this is also due to the traditional Western dichotomy of human rights, uh, with particular emphasis on civil and political rights without understanding that social justice and stability depends on the development of economic, social, and cultural rights. In Latin America, therefore, an horizontal meaning is lacking, is lacking 
a social vocation of fundamental rights from uh, an economic point of view is lacking, even if there is an understanding of this need, the systemic economic financial contents to implement uh, there are lacking. The cost and interference of US politics in Latin American countries, which generates unrest and coup d'etat to make. Click Maria, uh, I'm sorry for interrupting. If you could start wrapping up now, please. Sorry? If you could, if you could wrap up, please. Yes, um, this is the conclusion. I'm finishing. So uh, this, uh, this interference constantly of US politics in Latin American countries make it remain its backyard, does not facilitate the autonomy of region. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, 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 colleague. Um, with this one minute, if you could be succinct in your response so that we can proceed to the next speaker. You have touched on an important point, you know, of um, governments, if I understood you well, or even politicians, uh, uh, claiming to be people-centered, you know, claiming to be following a people-centered approach. In South Africa, my own country, we talk about a Batupili principle, which means the people first. But the sad reality is that all over the world, almost, uh, uh, governments may claim to be putting people first when it comes to human rights, but often they put people last. And you highlighted the issue of... Um, you know, rising extreme poverty and so on. But the people who should be addressing this violation of human rights often are the ones that are perpetrating these violations. In your own view, since we are talking about the future of human rights, how can we address this by ensuring that those that are put in power to address these critical issues indeed do so? If you could be succinct, I'll appreciate it. Over to you, colleague. Yes, of course. Um, I think the only way is cooperation between states, between good practices. For example, uh, in Latin America, something is changing now. For example, the experience of BRICS countries, of which Brazil is a part and in which Argentina has asked it to enter, the Belt and Road Initiative as a materialization of a construction of a community of shared future for mankind, 20 countries of Latin America, a part of the Belt and Road Initiative, for example. And lastly, Argentina, which signed the Memorandum on Understanding on February 6th of this year, uh, thus celebrating the first 50 years of bilateral relations with China. Uh, many Latin American countries are integral strategic partners of China, for example, no? generating a counterbalance of traditional alliance that I was okay. remarking, remarking, no? USA okay. and Europe, uh, and, and okay. finally, towards okay. an improvement in the develop, development cooperation practice. For example, large progress are yeah. currently underway to import mm -hmm. some good practices for the eradication of extreme poverty from China, to yeah. Latin American countries. Okay. On that note, thank you very much, colleagues. Let's give uh, colleague Maria a warm round of a virtual applause and before we move on over to the next uh, candidate uh, uh, speaker. Thank you, colleague. Colleagues, with your permission now, please allow me uh, to invite uh, our next speaker, Professor Mehmet Okiazus. I hope I pronounce your surname correctly, uh, co colleague. Uh, we're always on first name terms, you know, and uh, over the period, I haven't mastered pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, colleague Mehmet is a professor of political science at the Middle East Technical University in Ankara, Turkey. He will be addressing us on pandemic control in Turkey, the thin line between centralism and political participation. Ten minutes, colleague, and we'll appreciate it if you could spare us a minute or two. Over to you. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, I will shortly, necessarily shortly, thank the organizers and participants for having me invited here. And also thanks to you, George, for your active and participatory, and it's a link to my presentation, uh, chairmanship or chairpersonship. I appreciate this. 
Uh, so the words I will now present are mostly derived from a publication which I have made, uh, and I will try to, to not extend my 10 minutes. Uh, we have already spoken, uh, Peter had spoken about this film and all the others about the Declaration of Human Rights of December 48. Uh, but in general, I have to say uh, that uh, this was um, merely, uh, mainly abstract, um, a little bit general, but not at least not too concrete listing of categories of basic rights and individual freedoms. Uh, even if the character of this guideline uh, of 1948 was of existential need, because uh, having in mind the catastrophes of the 20th century, this was already mentioned, the catastrophe of Second World War, of millions of dead people, of racism, etc., and also the division of the world in colonial and colonialized countries, among other structural inequalities uh, and other forms of injustice. But one thing was missing, I think, uh, necessarily missing in this declaration. This was the implementation of these rights. And this implementation had to be developed uh, in the following decades. Uh, the question of implementation uh, has to be touched upon both in national and international frameworks or levels. Furthermore, has to be linked to uh, the specific deba debates, which are, of course, different in different countries as a result of specific political and historical social formations in these societies. So this is uh, the framework in which will I locate my speech. Uh, let, let's make first some general uh, introductory remarks. I think in the everyday life of citizens, so citizen participation plays a central role for democratic life. Whatever this may be, because I agree with Phelim that always when we speak of democracy, etc., there is an ideological notion, of course, but let's say it in general due to my limited time. So it plays a central role in for democratic life. It is indispensable with regard to the possibility of social actors uh, to exert an uh, influence on political decisions. And I think since, since March 2020, in particular, uh, we have the pandemic crisis. And now I think globally in general, but also most of the time in centralized countries like myself, uh, where there was often a critique for undermining democratic mechanisms because of coping with the pandemic crisis. So the issue of participation, I think, has again increasingly been the subject of publications and in general, the public debate at the same time. And I think this conceptualization, this new conceptualization of participation is currently being carried out in a broader framework with the participation of different actors. And this, we can say, is also one of the uh, sub areas of human rights. Uh, it is important to understand this new sort of participation, maybe also having in touch in regard social inequalities, etc., and to cope with material, material resources. That means participation now, I think, has to become a new global instrument to understand inequalities between different social groups, but also between different socioeconomic formations in the historical developmental process and to solve them. So I think the technical formal uh, mechanisms of policy implementation uh, are supplemented, have to be supplemented by the communicative mechanisms of social debate at the same time. I think only then if this social side of the issue together with legal, technical, formal, political things, then we have, can speak of something I would call legal morality, that means, uh, that means the, uh, uh, the social struggles, uh, for example, the social question which was carried out, begin to be carried out in the 19th century by the labor movement now, is now uh, has again to be re-debated for establishing something like moral universalism, not as an abstract issue, but an, as an issue of, how can we say, historical struggles at the same time. Now coming to my country, since the beginning of the pandemic crisis in Turkey, we have a debate 
uh, about the influences of the pandemic crisis on social rights, social security, social security, the right to education, the protection of the family, etc. Also, the restructurization of state power mechanisms, which were, all, were always a problem in my country, but now did again come to the foreground. The right of assembly, the right to freedom of expression, never isolated from the social uh, questions. So all of these topics nowadays in my country, uh, are uh, not only in Turkey, by the way, across Turkey, are representing in, in areas in which we can also summarize under the term human rights at the same time. One specificity of Turkey is that uh, a centralized executive in Turkey was always a fact. It was not only a technical legal instrument for policy implementation until now, but also formative for the structuring of the content of public debates and for the nation state building in Turkey. So in Turkey, it's even more difficult maybe to uh, establish a sort of public participation due to specificities in my country than in other, uh, in other countries. So our mass organizations, such as trade unions or professional and class organizations, such as bar associations or medical associations, they are again trying to be involved, not only as uh, brainstorming mechanisms for to cope with the pandemic, they are trying also to be part of decision-making processes. They are trying to analyze and evaluate policy measures on their own, also digital, but it remains a tension in Turkey still between centralized politics in an historical and practical standpoint and the lively participation. This is the general characterization of Turkey. The social rights is the most, how can we say, centralized problem of these areas because I think the social problematic, social rights, social security, this is, how can we say, an area in which human rights finds their most concrete material everyday expression, I think, worldwide and also concerning uh, countries which were formerly seen as countries not to be too much harmed by these inequalities, but also in the so-called richer world. I think yeah. I have already uh, extending my time, George. I don't know. Yes, if yes, 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 yes. I will but, give you a couple of seconds just to, to okay. say your last words, okay. uh, colleague. Yeah. So more and more our civil society or so-called civil society organizations are trying to be involved and to participate in decision-making pro uh, pro processes in Turkey. Uh, also the problem of the transparency of policy implementation, the right to democratic participation, which is also the result of a long struggle in my country, has now again come to the agenda. Uh, but uh, it nowadays seems to be that uh, it is more and more seen as a necessity to cope with problems. And I think here I will stop. I hope that this uh, international <laughs> cooperation, uh, what also Maria Francesca Stajano has mentioned, yeah. should also yeah. be be ongoing during this yeah. process. Again, yeah. thank you for for your audience, thank but it was too fast, yeah. I think. Thank you, colleague. Uh, you have shared enough for us to have a meaningful yes. uh, uh, engagement. I can assure you, uh, colleagues. I keep on saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, you may wonder what is this man saying is basically yes, 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 um, it's a local thing. Um, I have a quick question which I cannot resist to ask if it could be brief so that we can move over to the next speaker. Um, Mehmet, the, 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 the pandemic, you know, in a topic you talk about pandemic control in Turkey and it reminded me of one of the biggest challenge and, uh, uh, um, you know, that we shouldn't leave out in terms of what this pandemic has done, it has effectively exposed the best and the worst in many governments all over the world in how they deal with human rights in the name of curbing the pandemic. You already gave one uh, uh, suggestion in terms of how best, you know, this, um, you know, we can ensure that we get the best out of this and not the worst, you know, by involving civil society, that civil society participation is important. Do you have another example or idea that you can share quickly in terms of lessons, you know, for going forward to ensure that uh, uh, in, in our quest to control, 
uh, 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 you know, um, pandemics or any crisis that uh, we advance and not, you know, undermine human rights. I think one important thing which we can, uh, one lesson which I can derive from my country is that the pandemic crisis nowadays has shown us that this is not only a medical question. And a lot of organizations in Turkey, for example, the medical professional organizations are more and more based on the events which happened, for example, the social inequalities which which, which, which are increasingly developing, they are more and more forced, focusing on the social side of events. And I right. think this is one point in general of human rights. That means the yeah. legal, political, which I mentioned, uh, yeah. level of human rights can be more and more. And I think this is a possibility, can be implemented with the social aspect of these problems. And this is now, right. I think, a chance uh, where, we, where we can continue, because on the other side, concerning the inequalities which happened are worse, yeah. and it is visible and observable. But I yeah. think the sensitivity to see the social side out yeah. of this, on the surface, medical problem can be a chance for further cooperation and to make, I think, to bring the social into the social rights again, to bring also a cooperation, yeah. for example, yes. between legal scientists yeah. and other scientists again to the agenda, I think. This should uh, be thank you, colleague. Chance, I think, yes. Yeah, thank on you. that note, I think uh, let's leave it there. Thank you very much, colleagues. Let's give Mehmet a warm round of a virtual applause. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll you. now hand over to um, our fourth speaker, uh, Dr. Theophilus Coleman who's a postdoctoral research fellow of the Center for International and Comparative Labor and Social Security Law at the Faculty of Law of the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. And he will be addressing us this morning on the right to privacy in a digital age in Africa. Over to you, Dr. Coleman. Uh, not more than 10 minutes. We'll appreciate it if we could win us some time for a little bit of engagement. Over to you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And um, I'll try and then go straight to the point and highlight the issues in terms of individual right to privacy in a digital age um, with specific focus on data protection. And also when I have time, I will discuss traditional African values such as Ubuntu and how it can infiltrate into individual right to privacy. Um, to begin with, um, the proliferation of internet-based and phone technology has had immense impact on many African countries. Um, internet-based technology has actually changed the way we work and how we live. And with, over the past two decades, with the technological boom, many African countries have witnessed um, data sharing, real-time cash transfer, cross-cultural communication and efficiency in um, industrial activities. The technological advancement has also um, enabled and served as a springboard for the realization of individual rights, such as freedom of speech and freedom of expression. And in the context of law, um, it has enabled access to law, which is a cardinal pillar of rule of law. One of the advantages of the digital transformation in Africa is that it has created this platform for young people, especially the youth, to demand accountability from political leaders. And one example is the situation in Nigeria where the youth utilize social media uh, and internet-based technology um, to mobilize one of the largest protests in, in the decade. Um, this was a response to the government establishment of the special anti-robbery squad known as SAS and their abuse of power. Um, even though the, this technology or technological advancement presents undeniable benefit to individuals and society at large, there are several downsides. And these downsides include um, privacy concerns. And this is because telecommunication, social media, and phone companies tend to collect um, 
personal data of individuals. And I'm very concerned about this because um, Africa has, Africa is the, is the continent with the largest youthful population. So if um, a telecommunication company just has the personal data of, 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 of the youth, they can abuse it at some point. And we've seen instances where some social media companies tend to create algorithms based on the personal data of individuals, what academics refer to as surveillance capitalism. The problem in Africa currently is that some governments in Africa tend to abuse the data as has been collected. And um, they tend to unlawfully monitor um, individuals such as journalists, political opponents, and activists. So they tend to use social media and the data that they have to restrict um, um, legitimate dissent by individuals. And that is a problem. When the government tends to in interfere in the personal liberty and privacy of individual, what it tends to do is that it is using these technological platforms, which has created that platform for expression by individuals. It is using that as a tool for repression. And we've seen instances in some African countries, such as um, Uganda, where the government, where the government um, restricted the use of social media um, platforms uh, during elections. And that was a serious issue in Uganda and Africa at large. Another problem with the technological advancement in Africa has been the, the, the knowledge, the technical knowledge by Africans to develop a legislative framework that strictly protects the data um, of private individuals. And we've seen this gap where we haven't been able to really develop laws that moves in tandem with the technological advancement. With this, we've seen even private companies um, keeping and storing individual um, personal data of individuals. But it must be indicated that some African countries have taken steps to ensure that the data protection, the data of individuals are protected. And countries such as South Africa, Zimbabwe, Rwanda, and Zambia have all taken steps to ensure that the personal data of individuals are protected. From a continental point of view, we haven't seen much from the African Union in terms of creating an overarching um, legal order that seeks to protect the personal data and the privacy of individuals. However, if you look at sub-regional um, organizations such as the ECOWAS, SADC, and um, um, COMESA, and recently the OHADA, we've seen instances where they've come out with strong um, um, policy framework to protect the rights of individuals. I will just quickly highlight the reasons why Africa needs strong and robust legislative framework to protect the data and the privacy of individuals. Um, one of the key things that we need to understand is that African countries and governments using the data to monitor its citizens um, breaches the fundamental rights of individuals. And we've seen instances where journalists um, are targeted and political opponents are targeted. That is, um, um, that clearly invades the right um, of privacy of an individual. Also, there is the need to regulate the use of big data and to safeguard the reputation of individuals in Africa. Looking towards the future, I believe that data privacy, um, data rights, and right to privacy will become a key issue in the discourse in many African countries. And um, it is important that African countries develop a strong and robust legislative framework that deals with some of these issues. In dealing with strong and legislative framework, we shouldn't forget that there are some traditional African values that we can use to, to, to inform our right to privacy. So one of, the, one of the academic movement that is going on is the infusion of the traditional African value 
of Ubuntu into the general discourse of the right to privacy so that one can develop a distinctively unique policy framework that takes into account the very nature of our Africanness. But then this leads to some, um, this has led to some criticisms and, and this is mainly because Ubuntu, as I explained uh, the last time in the conference, is a purely communitarian concept. It is a concept that is anchored in the idea that a person is a person because of other people. So once there is this movement of thinking of Ubuntu from, a, from an Afrocentric point of view, then we are sort of pushing this idea of communitarianism onto the whole idea of individualism in the right to privacy. And that invariably reduces the individual idea of um, privacy. So um, privacy becomes secondary when we try to push um, traditional African values into the framework of this individual um, right to privacy. But that notwithstanding, um, moving forward, we need a concerted effort, not just from national or from a domestic point of view, we need a concerted effort from regional, the regional blocks in Africa. We also need the African Union to be very proactive in ensuring that the data uh, of citizens in Africa are rightly protected and not subjected to abuse in by private entities or foreign government. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Coleman. Um, it's right on the dot, but a quick question, if you could be succinct. Uh, you touch on really important issues and this link up with the earlier points made um, by, uh, by Professor Mao in his opening remarks and also uh, uh, by uh, Professor Hammond. And also uh, this links up with the um, uh, issue raised by Feldman, uh, Feldman and I'll tell you why. Um, that um, in, 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 you know, in the light of the recent developments, particularly of artificial intelligence, globalization and so on, we see, especially on the African continent, um, companies harvesting data uh, at will, doing things that they wouldn't do in their own regions, in their own countries, but on the African continent is open season. And now it brings back the issue of me, myself and I, you know, that as long as I can harvest and become rich as a country, others don't matter. How do we address this as a continent to show that human rights elsewhere should be human rights everywhere? If um, the global North feel their rights, you know, of their citizens to be protected against this data harvesting hungry uh, companies, and they need to also understand that also in the global South, people also have the same right to be protected, despite the fact that some of the governments on the continent are not actively protecting their citizens against this uh, thing that we are seeing. And, and we have heard that data is now the new oil. So how do we protect this? Uh, briefly, over to you, Dr. Coleman. Um, thank you. As you rightly said, data is the new oil, and it's because um, of how people can utilize algorithms and even target for purposes of advertisement in on social media and all that. The point is that in Africa, we've actually taken a relaxed approach in terms of protection of, of, of the data of individuals compared to the European Union that took a swift approach where there is this directive that you cannot even transfer um, yeah. data to, to a country that is not um, within the European Union member country and even imposes obligation on European Union member countries on how to treat and process data. In African countries, we do not. But then yeah. there is always a way forward. And that is why this becomes an important, as important step to yeah. take. Um, we need to strengthen our regional yeah. and sub-regional legal framework. Uh, yes, on privacy yeah. and human rights. Dr. Coleman, mm -hmm. uh, um, on that note, I'm sorry for interrupting. I'm worried about time. I take the fact that we need to strengthen our regional bodies. Obviously, that should filter through to individual countries. I wish we had more time to discuss this important topic. Let me take this opportunity and thank you, Dr. Coleman, and also invite members uh, uh, present on this call, uh, colleagues, to share a warm round of a virtual applause for Dr. Coleman. Um, colleagues, 
we are slightly over the allotted time. Um, I'm sorry, we have to leave it here. Let me hand over to colleague uh, 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 Juan and uh, 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 apologize for being slightly over the allotted time. This is really an important topic and the temptation of going on is always there, but I resisted it as best as I can and so did members of the panel. I thank each and every one of you for your attention. Over to you, uh, Juan.